All right, guys. So uh, Adrian Broner defeats Gavin Reese by a fifth round TKO. I'm gonna go ahead and give you my post fight thoughts on this uh, on this bout. Um, I wasn't at home, you know, um, during the fight. I was actually, uh, you know, out, you know, but uh, I was still able to um, watch a good part of the fight. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you guys my post fight of that. Give you my thoughts on this, and just talk a little bit about what's next for Mr. Broner. So let's go ahead and get into the fight, man. Um, first couple of rounds um, is where you probably thought that Gavin Reese was going to have his best shot of really getting to Broner. It's, it's those feel-out rounds. You know, I expected Broner to come out, try to find his distance. But Gavin Reese was really slippery in those first couple of rounds. Obviously, he's been watching a lot of tape of the uh, Tony DeMarco versus Adrian Broner fight, and he kept saying it in the build-up to this fight. You know, Gavin Reese kept saying, Antonio DeMarco stood right in front of you. I'm not going to do that. And in those first couple of rounds, that's basically what Gavin Reese was able to do. Okay, he came out, and he basically would be in front of Broner, and then he wouldn't be in front of Broner. Okay, so he'd basically get inside, bam, bam, you know, work the body a little bit, and then get out of there, you know, before... Broner could start landing those nasty uppercuts and those straight rights and that, and that type of d thing, you know. So he followed the game plan pretty well in those first couple of rounds. You know, so Broner obviously was really patient in there. He was in no rush. Um, like he said in the post-fight interview, he was basically trying to figure out how much Reese really had in his tank. Kind of just figuring out Reese. And he's one of those guys who... He's got a unique fighting style. You know, it's hard to really classify him as just an inside fighter or just an outside fighter. He's just somewhere in between there, and he's a boxer. But where Reese really came up short is in the things that he really couldn't control. Broner is really strong. He's got good power. He had the reach advantage, the height advantage. And at the end of the day, he's just a better boxer. So at some point, you know, you knew what was going to go down. And it pretty much went down in the third in the fourth and in the fifth. So, you know, Broner closed the show and, uh, you know, he did what he had to do. Um, okay, so here are my thoughts on what's next for Broner. You know, I, I think it's going to get harder for Broner as he goes along. I really do because this fight kind of proves it. You know, this is boxing and this is one of those things where people are going to study your fights. People are going to study your fights and no matter who you are, you're always going to have trouble with with an opponent who studies you and really tries to come up with a legit game plan based off, off of what they've seen in the ring to beat you. I'll give you an example. Look what Juan Manuel Marquez was able to do with Manny Pacquiao. Okay? So, at the end of the day, these are boxers. And people are going to study your film and they're going to come up with different game plans for you. And I think Reese just gave people some more film to really look at on how to frustrate Broner. I'm not going to go as far as to say the blueprint is out on how to beat him. But I know the blueprint is out on what not to do. And I think that's the Antonio DeMarco fight. And I think that's what everyone's going to do now. They're going to watch the Antonio DeMarco fight. And they're going to say, hey, I'm not going to sit there and stand in front of this guy. I don't really see too many people doing that. Um, unless they're, that, they're just that type of fighter where that's the only way they know how to fight. Um, if you're a fighter who you have the ability to move around and box a little bit, like a Miguel Vasquez, then obviously you're not going to stand right in front of this guy. It's suicide. So that's what I think the game plan is going to kind of be in the future and what Broner is going to see a lot of. He's going to see a lot of guys trying to give him movement. So uh, I think it would serve him well to kind of start practicing to move around the ring Instead of just having that same style of coming forward and coming forward and coming forward. Um, so yeah, after this fight, did this fight really answer any questions? No. Did we think it was? Not really. Uh, you know, I mean, what happened is pretty much what everybody thought was going to happen. You know, Broner systematically broke down Gavin Reese. That's what he does. You know, he systematically breaks you down and then he finishes the job. One thing I got to give Broner props on is he's a really good finisher and I do like that. Uh, he gets you hurt, he's getting you out of there. You know, he's not like a lot of these other fighters. Uh, I think Peter Quillen is a great example. Peter Quillen has amazing, you know, power, but he's not a finisher. 
you know, um, Adrian Broner, if he gets you hurt, you know, it's hook right, good night, like he says. You know, you're going to sleep for the most part. Or, you know, he's going he's gonna to close the show and get you out of there and, and make your corner stop the fight. Um, but like I said, not too many questions answered about Adrian Broner during this fight. And I still do have questions because right now Adrian Broner has a great size advantage over these lightweights. Um, and I'm wondering a couple of things. How is his power going to transfer to the next weight class? So is he going to be able to you know, keep his power as he moves up? And then also, is his power going to have the same effect on a guy like a Lucas Matisse? I'm going to use him for an example because Lucas Matisse rehydrates to 160 plus. You know? Uh, so in all fairness, first of all, people can be asking the question, should Lucas Matisse even be at 140? But that's a different video. But he, he rehydrates to 160 plus. So that being said... Broner isn't going to have the same effect punching a guy who rehydrates to say 140, 145, as opposed to a guy who rehydrates to 160, and you know, who's a really strong guy in there. Okay? So that's one of the questions I do have. You know, also, we still got to question the fact of how Broner is going to react when he gets tagged with a really good one. Still a lot of questions out there. Once again, um, I do think that this guy is the best lightweight in the world. You know? Um, I don't really think there's too much doubt about that. And let's see if he fights the winner of Vasquez and Ricky Burns. I'll tell you this much. I'll be very surprised if Adrian Broner fights Miguel Vasquez. I'll be very surprised. I'll be very surprised. Um, it's just a really dangerous fight. And you really don't see Adrian Broner calling out Miguel Vasquez's name. He hasn't said yet that we're going to fight the winner of Vasquez and Burns. He's pretty much said... If you notice, we want Ricky Burns. We want Ricky Burns. If we don't get Ricky Burns, we're probably going to move up. So I don't really see him fighting Miguel Vasquez. And I haven't really heard him say Richard Abreu's name. So, I mean, I don't know. But the ground underneath him is kind of shrinking. It's kind of shrinking on, on, on lightweight. So, I mean, he's. I'm thinking he's got to start fighting some of these champions at lightweight if he's going to stay here. So it's going to get harder for him. It's going to get harder for him pretty soon. Um, and I'm still wondering how he's going to do. And just so I can make my position clear on Adrian Broner, I think he's a great fighter. He's going to win a lot of fights. And I do th think he's going to lose fights. I don't. I think if the, the, the standard that he's going for is the Mayweather standard of kind of finishing undefeated and really beating everybody, I don't see it. So I'll make that clear now. I, I don't see him clean in house at 140 if he fights everybody there. I see fights that I could see him definitely losing there. Um, and it's just a stylistic thing. Um, but who knows? Maybe I'll get a chance, if I could really get a chance to see him and see how he moves around the ring. But um, as far as between him and Mayweather, he just doesn't have the same tools, offensively or defensively. The jab isn't as consistent. Uh, you know, and having that a big, a good jab is just really huge. The reflexes aren't as good. You know, Floyd Mayweather is a defensive master. And at the end of the day, Adrian Broner is more offensive minded than Floyd. You know, and when you're more offensive minded, you're going to be more vulnerable. You know, that comes with the territory. So he's going to be in more dangerous situations. But at the same time, he's got the power to dish it out. So it's really always fun watching this guy. It's really interesting watching him when he's in the ring. And uh, we're going to continue to ask the questions. Uh, of where he's going to be most effective. I don't think he should rush up now to 140. You know, I think he just got to lightweight. You know, as soon as he got there, he challenged the champion there. But, but if you're going to stay at lightweight, I do want to see you fight the best guys at lightweight. So go ahead and fight Vasquez. Okay. Go ahead, fight Burns. You know, if Burns actually wants to man up and take the fight, you know, go try to fight Richard Abreu. Fight these champions, unify the belts, and then after you do that, you know, go ahead and try to take 140. So those are my thoughts, man. Pretty good performance by Broner. Um, I don't think he's unbeatable. Just my thoughts. You guys let me know what y'all think about this fight. What do y'all think about Adrian Broner? Who would y'all like to see him fight next? Peace.